Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Did you see the conflagration nation nation emblazoned on that crew? It was the wrath of mighty God on Tippecanoe and Webster too. And now we can claim all that land, land, never mind old Britain. Now we can claim all the land. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. I'm your contributing guest host and hoodwinked Book of Boba Fett enthusiast, Eric Bond. This week, we return to our old kindling timeline. So, in this timeline, Andrew Jackson goes with hickory wooden pipes instead of iron ones for when the White House decided to get plumbing installed for the White House washroom. Yes, really, it is quite a big deal, I know, because it ends up preventing William Henry Harrison, also known as Tippecanoe of Tippecanoe and Tyler II fame, from dying of typhoid. He gets to live past the initial 31 days of his presidency, only then to end up dying in an artillery mishap on the USS Princeton on February 27th of 1844. So if you ever get bored having to watch HGTV with your parents, remember, those granite countertops might just save you from getting typhoid as well. At the very least, it'll look very tasteful for your engagement party. Now, about William Henry Harrison, his newly completed term was not a complete failure. He had founded the Third National Bank some 10 to 15 years, depending on how you count it, earlier than in our own timeline. He steered an increased tariff from 20% to 40% through Congress on imported goods. This helped to fund the federal government. And that's about what I will say for his positive contributions. There's a stable economy, and now everything else is going to go very poorly. So, let's review. Perhaps one of the biggest issues at this time is the cooling of diplomatic relations with Great Britain, which he will mostly do to remind folks that he was a bigger and better general than Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812. Secondly, he will be ignoring any and all claims from the Texas Republic and from the Mexican government over competing land. He will avoid any attempts to discuss slavery... Sometimes he will say, I'm a free soiler, meaning that he wants to get rid of slavery. He just also wants to deport any African Americans, regardless of their status and whether or not they had ever actually been born in Africa. And maybe the abolitionists, too, while he's thinking about it. The other alternative he was trying to get through that nobody wanted to touch was the idea of popular sovereignty. That is... When a territory wants to become a state, they would vote on whether to be a free state or whether to be a slave state. This was also untenable because it meant that, well, we could see people from outside that territory come in to influence the election, like we saw during Bleeding Kansas in the 1850s of our own timeline. Or it could mean more likely for the Southerners that a bunch of abolitionists would try to move in and prevent further expansion of slavery out west. Either way, not going to get through this Congress. Lastly, he was destroying the culture and seizing the land of indigenous American groups, mostly by utilizing Indian schools. This is a process in which children were taken from their parents' homes, put through private schools, which would seek to deprive them of their indigenous culture and traditions. 
This mostly stems from Harrison's belief that it was, to borrow a phrase, the white man's burden to Christianize and modernize his indigenous neighbors. Honestly, Tippecanoe was probably better off dying in bed than spitting his last breath in the Potomac with hot metal going through his body, but in all cases, he'd probably just prefer being alive in either scenario. This will take us now to November 28th of 1844, with John Tyler arriving from his widower's pad in Walnut Grove in Virginia, and quickly being sworn in as the 10th President of the United States. And we're going to see what a mess he'll make of it within the remaining months of the presidency. An election is coming up, and John Tyler wants to be in it, baby. Ugh, I'm very sorry for having said that. Let's move on. So, not everybody is thrilled about John Tyler just declaring himself the president. In our own timeline, because Harrison had died so quickly, it was kind of just readily accepted. We need somebody to fill the post. The problem is, is that the Constitution does not specifically state vice president means you become president once the actual president is dead. It says something more along the lines of, Vice President shall assume the duties and powers of President, and that's about it. They don't go into, does there need to be a new election? Do we need to at least elect a new Vice President? What is the situation? But John Tyler was not going to have any doubts about his authority. He was jumping straight into it, and the House of Representatives, under the leadership of a John W. Jones, and by John W. Jones, I really mean the governor of Indiana and former Speaker of the House, James K. Polk, would start to sue for a ruling from the Supreme Court about the constitutionality of John Tyler declaring himself president. Thankfully, John Tyler, since he is still technically a member of the Whig Party, has none other than Henry Clay to come in and support him. This will not last long. Now, if there is one thing you need to know about Henry Clay, it's that he has had a burning ambition to be president ever since entering politics earlier in his life. Henry Clay was also very conflicted about the issue of slavery and how it would expand out into the West. Henry Clay himself was a slave owner but felt that the best way to proceed was keeping with the Missouri Compromise, in which slavery would not pass the 36th parallel into the northern half of the United States, but that would mean the U.S. would constantly need to expand. Take, for instance, the Roman model where a certain acreage of land would be given to returning soldiers. It sounds like a really great deal. The problem is, is that you effectively need to keep making more land grabs in order to have more acres for returning soldiers. This is going to have to be the same issue, especially because the most northern territory that could possibly be divided is in Oregon, which is jointly shared by the British, who are not looking to leave. And it's a tricky diplomatic situation, especially because, like I said before, William Henry Harrison essentially rejected any diplomatic ties from the British government to remind everybody how much better than Andrew Jackson Harrison was. He was not. Anywho, it would probably be I would give it a month's time before the Democrats would drop their plans once they had learned that Tyler planned on annexing Texas, regardless of Henry Clay's concerns about the whole expanding slavery out west. Because Texas, one of the main reasons it broke away from Mexico, was that they wanted slavery, something which had been abolished by the Mexican government in the 1820s. Now. Henry Clay makes it clear to John Tyler, you are no longer a member of the Whig Party, you are out. John Tyler says that's totally fine. He renames his uh, plantation from Walnut Grove to Sherwood Forest because he is a political outlaw. 
And there's something a little bit ironic about a slave owner talking about how he is Robin Hood, and I guess everybody else is Prince John. But anywho, with no Henry Clay to support him, Tyler decides to go to the Democrats, making the deal of, I will help to bring Texas into the fold, I just want two things. First of all, I want to be the nominee of the Democratic Party in the election of 1844. Secondly, I want to have a wedding on the White House grounds. Let's set the scene. It is going to be on April 20th of 1844, just a week shy of the two-month anniversary of the Princeton disaster. Tyler and Julia Gardner she being the daughter of the New York Senator David Gardner, who also just happened to have died in the explosion on the Princeton, are trying to exchange vows before the Supreme Court Justice Henry Baldwin. Julia would have rather eloped in her own native New York, of course, but Tyler wanted to make a point. He was the president now. It is a point that will not be successfully made. Now, whether it was the appearance of princely privilege being extended to his accidency through this very odd demonstration of his authority. Actually, no, it might have been that the bridegroom was the same age as her deceased father, uh, 54 to her 24 years old, for those interested, which now made Julia Gardner five years younger than her soon-to-be eldest stepchild, Mary Tyler. Whether or not she married a Mary Tyler Moore, no one knows. Actually, then again, it was perhaps the throng of Western hicks in strange clothing who were protesting just outside the gates of the White House lawn. Uh, there was some petty little prophet of the uh, Letter Day Saints or whatever saying Heavenly Father had punish Tippecanoe, and so now he will punish old Prince John. Yeah. However, no one was going to pay them any mind. And then the court justice Baldwin died before vows could be said. Julia booked it in a mad dash from the altar, followed by any of the guests who were particularly superstitious. This probably being all of them, utter panic ensues. Now, the leader of this protest, Joseph Smith Jr., couldn't have had a better day. He was the mayor of the city and the general of the Nauvoo Rifles of the same name in Illinois, and he had been lobbying for the retrieval or at least compensation for lost property of the Church of Latter-day Saints since Martin Van Buren's inauguration in 1836. Martin Van Buren was, of course, no help. He tried going to Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe also said, no way. So, Joseph Smith started circulating a letter foretelling of divine retribution. This went out two days before the Princeton disaster. So, now, Heavenly Father had passed his judgment on Tyler just as Tippecanoe, seemingly. Surely Smith's own presidency was going to be assured. That's right, Joseph Smith was also running for president of the United States. He advocated the immediate freedom of slaves in exchange for a fair market compensation to slave owners. Likewise, he thought that the U.S. should annex not only Texas, but California, Oregon, Canada, Alaska, and Mexico. Whether he was planning to go further in a Simone Bolivar fashion, we do not know. But maybe we will by the end of this episode. Despite his grand plans, Joseph Smith Jr. would have to book it for Massachusetts because John Tyler was definitely going to send the militia after him after he is seemingly killed a Supreme Court justice through the wrath of God. Once he makes, makes it to Massachusetts, I imagine that Joseph Smith would probably get involved with the nascent abolitionist movement there, specifically with a Mr. Walker Lewis. Walker Lewis was the third African-American member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, specifically the third one to receive a priesthood. 
within the church. He would be hosting Joseph Smith and Joseph's legal wife, Emma Smith, at their home in Lowell before Joseph Smith would go on to Boston. You can picture the scene. Joseph Smith is receiving a wonderful haircut from Mr. Walker Lewis, who in his day life was a barber and in his nighttime activities was a conductor on the Underground Railroad for escaped African slaves. Suddenly, there's a knock on the door. Oh, that's weird. Probably somebody wanting to inquire. Maybe it was an unscheduled stop on the trail, but Walker Lewis goes to answer it, and he sees a thin man. Graying dark hair, the most intense eyes he had ever seen in anyone. And the man asks him if he's of any relation to the abolitionist Elijah P. Lovegood. He had noticed that the house was listed under Lewis Lovegood, meaning that perhaps he had married one of Lovegood's daughters. But Walker Lewis just insisted it was a probable coincidence of maiden names from his wife. The man gives him a sack of money and is invited in at Joseph's command. And that's how Joseph Smith, John Brown, and Walker Lewis were about to begin a most interesting partnership. But we'll get back to that in a little bit. A few weeks later, it was time for the nomination convention of the Whig Party. Henry Clay, of course, became the nominee for president, as was expected, and he was hoping for the last time. Surely now, Tyler was going to bow to the reality of the situation. If he was hoping to become the nominee of the Whigs or the Democrats or whatever own party, there was no way he was going to bring Texas into the Union without Senate ratification of any treaty, especially since Texas was technically a foreign government at the time. Reality is a curious thing, though. I have often found that anyone who is sufficiently unsound mentally and free of any tiny things such as shame, they certainly seem to be able to bend the discussion of what even constitutes reality to begin with. Let's take, for example, the idea of slavery. When the framers of the Constitution were writing it up, they felt that slavery had at least been on the way out for some time. After all, it was just too expensive to maintain a workforce along with feeding and clothing for them. How much money can you really make off of cotton and tobacco? Well, it would turn out quite a lot, for there was a market for them, especially within the North in textile companies who needed cotton cheap and available, something the South could provide, and internationally, Britain and France were the largest markets for U.S. Southern cotton, so there's a lot of money to be gained, and there's also the psychological benefit to having people in your thrall. This is why in our own timeline we saw that the end of slavery could not come peacefully in our own time. That's something that John Brown would prove during Bleeding Kansas and something the Civil War would cement. And you could say, well, isn't it logical to put efficiency at the front of any business enterprise? Yeah, but people love to be comfy, and they love to keep things the same. Especially when keeping things as status quo makes you a whole ton of money. Just look at the North and South at this time. That's why, when we see the election of 1844, everyone's basically promising the same things, and nobody is talking about, well, if slavery has always been on its way out, when's it going to be gone? And nobody wants to answer that. So make of reality what you will in this case. Tyler, for right now, was stuck trying to figure out this problem himself. He needed to bring Texas into the fold if he had any hope of becoming the member of the Democratic Party again, especially the nominee for president. So, he sent a special delegation off to the Oregon Territory. That delegation being led by a Mr. 
James Buchanan, a former minister to the British Court of St. James and also to the Russian Empire for the United States. He needed to get there in order to broker a proper deal with the British, something that was going to be very complicated given the last four years of indifference from the Harrison administration. Now, at this time, it would take about five weeks, so Tyler was likely to not become the official nominee for the Democratic Party. It probably still would have fallen to James K. Polk. Political machine made flesh. However, let's imagine the office of Sir John Pelly, the manager of the Hudson Bay Company and essentially the de facto governor of British Oregon. Pelly is in his office, probably puttering around trying to make sense of the Americans' demand. Right now, Canada has been a complete mess. The Canadians have been pushing for responsible government this and self-rule that, and have been really aching under the yoke of management from an island some hundred <laughs> miles away and more. And everybody knew that the Oregon Territory just wasn't really worth all the trouble. Even his own superior, George Hamilton Gordon, the Earl of Aberdeen, brought up how the territory of Oregon wasn't worth a barren hill in Scotland. Still, Sir John Pelly had to save face. Before the explosion of the Princeton, Webster himself had been trying to deal with Sir Pelly and bring Harrison around to just having any sort of actual diplomatic relationship with the British Empire, but Harrison would always say no. This made John Pelly, who was more like an official businessman for the British Empire than a real diplomat, the closest diplomatic tie that the White House under Harrison would allow. And they just needed some hope of an honorable conciliation. Or at very least, quiet tensions, because some of the Canadians and a few of the American settlers in Oregon were pushing for a war, and that had to be avoided. Britain ruled the seas and could manage a river campaign, but where would it end? Keeping it contained to Oregon was impractical. That would require heavy resilience on Canadian ground forces and British Marines. If they attacked both the East Coast and North Coast, well, that would deplete an already strained economy between the British adventures in India, China, and Africa and their hopes of getting involved in the Middle East. Plus, fighting in Oregon might spill over into Russian Alaska, and as lowly populated as that was, tensions with Russia were still already on the high end than was comfortable for anyone, especially on the continent. After the Congress of Vienna had decreed that Napoleon was really defeated by the Russians curtailing his ambitions, well, they were starting to act like the policemen of Europe, and that uh, annoyed everyone. Pelly briefly mused on just attacking San Francisco Bay and gifting it to Buchanan as a Dean Geld of sorts, but British investors were looking to start lending money to the Mexican government, so everything seemed like a bad idea. That's when James Buchanan is finally ushered into his office with the manager of the Russian-American company, and thus also the de facto governor of Russian Alaska, Arvid Adolf Ethelin, with an intriguing idea. They would cede up to the 54th parallel the Oregon Territory. However, the Hudson Bay Company would still be granted British citizenship and would still have a British laws applied to them rather than American laws, and they would be given a $15 million indemnity for the trouble. There was just one more proviso that Pelly wanted to have agreed to, and the Russians were more than happy to maintain a American border state between British Canada and Russian Alaska. This proviso was simply, no slavery can exist in this territory. 
it cannot be allowed. While the British themselves had only stopped practicing slavery some years before, they had decided to make it a mission that if you wanted to do business with them, you cannot be an active participant in the world slave trade. And Buchanan, rather annoyedly, agreed to this. This brings us up to the summer months before the campaign. Tyler had heard of the deal that Buchanan struck and was excited. Surely both the House and the Senate would agree to these terms. They can bring Texas in and divvy up the Oregon territories appropriately, and maybe divvy up Texas itself since it was such a large territory and keep the Missouri Compromise in place. Surely both parties could agree to that. They did agree that it was a good idea. However, nobody wanted to give any other group a political victory. Polk didn't want Tyler as a challenger. Tyler didn't want the credit to go to Polk or Clay. And Clay didn't want the credit to go to Polk or Tyler especially. So now we're in this basically suicide pact between three groups, all who want to be president and don't want to share their toys. Whether or not this sounds familiar, I leave it up to you, dear audience. But for right now, everything is going to have to be focused on the campaign. Clay can now save face and say he wants to bring Texas into the Union, and he'll bring Oregon as well, and just make sure there is enough territory to create states to equal out slave and free. Polk is going to argue the same thing, but push for a more aggressive agenda maybe even into Russian ter territory, maybe even more into Canada. He, of course, does not plan to go through on this. Polk was very comfortable lying to people. It was a habit he had taken up since childhood. To give you an idea, Polk spoke with a folksy twang. This was not at all native to Polk. Polk received coaching from his wife, Sarah, who basically acted as his chief of staff, so marriage goals there. And essentially tried to turn him into a folksy man of the people. Oftentimes, he would have to ha have Sarah explain jokes to him so he could understand why it was funny. Now, Sarah was also his political mind as well, and most politicians agreed they really wish Sarah had been the president instead, but we're <laughs> gonna save that for a little bit. As for the campaign, Tyler is going to be brutally embarrassed again because Julia Gardner decided to run off with that prophet character to Massachusetts and become a Mormon. Now, Joseph Smith had been putting off going back to Illinois, especially to deal with a recent paper called the Nauvoo Expositor, who was trying to do a tell-all uh, point of view from an ex-Mormon who was claiming that Joseph was practicing polygamy. Joseph said he wasn't. He actually, in reality, was, especially with making members' wives his quote-unquote spiritual wives at this time. Huge messy situation. And Emma Smith emphatically denied that polygamy was being practiced, or that she would ever stay with Joseph if he became a polygamist. Hint, hint, Joseph. But Joseph Smith might have been a creative man, he might have been an early advocate for equal rights among uh, white and black citizens, but he was still a troubled man and made Julia one of his spiritual wives. As for his new partner, John Brown, and bringing himself into the Underground Railroad with the help of Walker Lewis, well... John Brown believed in the Golden Rule. He just wanted to be treated as he treated other people, and Walker Lewis had unsuccessfully attempted to become a polygamist himself because he was just trying to keep up with the mandates of the Prophet. So they were both willing to work with him because the eye of the prize was ending slavery, and John Brown had a great idea. We're going to get back to that in a little bit. But for right now, Tyler is in a brutal position, having been embarrassed by this a prophet character and by uh, James K. Polk and Henry Clay. 
Now, in our own timeline, Tyler had given up. Andrew Jackson, in fact, convinced him to stand down on the promise that Texas would be annexed into the Union. But John Tyler had suffered for so long, well, so long for such a short time as he was president. For the rest of his term, he had been essentially just collecting his check at Walnut Grove, now Sherwood Forest, as vice president. But now he wanted to be in charge and have everybody say he was in charge. So he was going to see this until the bitter end. So let's get to the election of 1844. Here are our results. 138 electoral votes to win. There will be 275 total. John Tyler surprisingly takes the lead with 97 electoral votes. Polk is a close second, well, second-ish, at 77 electoral votes. And Clay comes in third with 74 electoral votes. And Joseph Smith somehow secures 15 electoral votes for Illinois and, strangely enough, Connecticut. As to why he succeeded so well in Connecticut, no one knows. However, if you can do the math there, you see that none of them got 138 votes. This means that, according to the Constitution, a contingent election must be held. So, the Twelfth Amendment specifically says the top three candidates will advance, and on February 9th of 1845, the House of Representatives, at least the outgoing House of Representatives, must then, as a block for each state, so each delegation will vote, who will become the president. And since this is the party of James K. Polk, Polk will win. Now... This was not a great day for John Tyler, especially. He had the most electoral votes, and now he can cast himself essentially as an Andrew Jackson figure, done in by another corrupt bargain. However, he's not going to go anywhere, because John Tyler's estate would be raided that same day. According to his white taskmasters on the estate, a c group of some... 200 men led by John Brown and Joseph Smith raided the estate, captured all of the taskmasters and any white servants who resisted, and burnt down his mansion. And then, to add some salt into the wound, they released all the slaves. They traveled through Charles City and upon the USS Perry, which was a merchant vessel of noted abolitionist French Rodney, they were able to escape up back into Boston Territory, where they were then able to go through the Underground Railroad and escape. So, Tyler has lost not only his political fortune, but his also actual fortune. He's a pauper and will be essentially living off of the kindnesses of his children, whom he had estranged by not telling them that he was going to get engaged to a 24-year-old. So, you know, we still probably will see that in our own time today. But let's continue on with our story. The Oregon Territory will be added into the U.S. as a group of differing states. So will Texas as a slave state. And this will help to maintain the Missouri Compromise. Clay and Polk are going to have to work together in order to bring this about. That means the U.S. is also now going to be involved with Russia as a direct neighbor while also managing Canada and the native Canadians are not pleased about this state of events, because now it's just confirmed their worst fears that they have been abandoned by Mother Britain. To round things off, I'm going to be making some predictions based on where things will go in the next 10 years. Joseph Smith and his group are probably going to eventually leave for the Oregon Territory, and because of the new 36th parallel, 
it will be considered a slave state, but going to cause quite an issue when they decide to make it a free one. This will be, of course, after Joseph Smith has been arrested for practicing witchcraft, which was still technically a crime on the Boston books. However, he was eventually released because they found that a man claiming to be a prophet of the Christian god specifically is probably not logically following a witch. Carrying on, the Crimean War within the 1850s is now going to have a Russian-American component because America will be drawn as a mediator between the Russian Alaskan Territory and Canada to prevent it from spreading onto the North American continent. Mexico will still declare war on the U.S., but will receive allies in Canada as a, an, an aid in revenge for the Oregon Territory deal. The U.S. will be able to put down both the Mexican government and the Canadians, but they will not grab any further territory from Canada as a nod to Great Britain. Canada will then eventually declare itself independent, mostly... <laughs> Uh, announcing their own separate nations among their current state lines. So Quebec is now a French Republic in North America. I definitely think that John Brown would become a member of the Mormon group. I don't think he himself would convert to Mormonism, but I do think that he would be a natural partner with them, especially when they decide to break the Missouri Compromise by declaring themselves a free state. This will probably precipitate, if not the Civil War, definitely a war uh, in the mold of the Bleeding Kansas incident. So, however you slice it, we will probably see a Civil War within the next 20 years of this new timeline. I hope you guys have enjoyed this series. I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Please, again, send any comments, concerns, or questions to our website, a aforkintimepodcast.com. You can also become a contributing member on Patreon for no more than eight silver quarters. That's right, just $2, and you can help us produce the show. You can also go to tpublic.com to where we have a merchandise available. And just remember, if you ever come across a fork in time, take it. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.